we are now live. Excellent. Do you need me to start the recording then? Have you? No, I can do it. All right, perfect. I will do that and then we'll get started. I'm sure everyone will join me. All right, excellent. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure there'll be people joining us, but welcome to the second keynote uh, lecture presentation of the uh, 2021 IBB World Championship. On what is technically day two, but I know for, for many of you, it could be early in the morning or early in the evening or the middle of the night, depending on where you are, uh, but we appreciate having you here nonetheless. Um, I'm really excited about this uh, opportunity for the keynote, and I hope you are too. Before I turn it over, just a couple of little house cleaning items. If you if you could please, when you um, for all our national champions are here, if you wanted to go ahead and change your name, and I'm going to do it now so you can see and put at the bottom what country you are representing, um, that would be very nice for us to see. Um, also, I encourage you if you want to to turn your camera on um, and have it on during the talk. We love we love to see you. It's exciting for us to see all your faces. Um, so please go ahead and do that. Uh, I ask you to keep your, your camera on mute though during the presentation. And if you come up with questions, which I really encourage you to do, you can think of as you're listening to the presentation, we will do a Q&A session at the end. Um, and if you come up with questions, and I know sometimes you might not feel comfortable asking the question directly, you may you may send the message to me in, in chat and I will be more than happy to ask the question for you. But um, also we will just take people if they raise their hand towards the end and we'll do Q and A that way. So with those details taken care of, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Claire Sexton who is a member of the um, planning committee uh, for this year to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Garth. Uh, my name is Claire Sexton. I'm Director of Scientific Programs and Outreach at the Alzheimer's Association. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Leah Grimberg. Uh, Dr. Grimberg is a neuropathologist who specializes in brain aging and associated disorders, most notably Alzheimer's and the neurological basis of sleep disturbances in neurodegenerative diseases. Back in 2003, Dr. Grimberg was among the founders of a brain bank in Sao Paulo, focusing on brain aging. This brain bank has since developed into an extremely prolific and highly regarded institution and has helped Dr. Greenberg prove that contrary to what was, had been accepted previously, that it is the brain stem and not the cortex which harbors the first detectable neurodegeneration in Alzheimer's disease. In 2009, Dr. Greenberg was the recipient of the UNESCO L'Oreal Award for Women in Science. And in 2010, she received the John Douglas French Alzheimer's Foundation Distinguished Research in Scholar Award. Currently, she is a full professor and a John Douglas French Alzheimer's Foundation and now professor at the University of California, San Francisco Memory and Aging Center, where she is the co-leader of the UCSF Neurodegenerative Disease Brain Bank. Leah is also the directs the human brain the Human Biology Validation Core for the NIH U54 Tau Centers Without Walls. She is the Principal Investigator uh, within the Tau Consortium and co-lead of the Neuropathology Core for the Leeds Project. She is also a Professor of Pathology at the University of Sao Paulo, a member of the Executive Board of the Global Brain Health Institute and a member of the Medical Scientific Advisory Group for the Alzheimer's Association. And it's a real pleasure to introduce you and to be hearing from uh, Leah today. Thank you very much, Claire. It's really a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be seeing all you this uh, morning or afternoon or evening. I, I felt uh, very honored to get this invitation. I uh, also kind of got uh, you know, into research when I, when I was uh, on my on high school and uh, really started my career. So today I would like to uh, share with you a little bit of uh, my research, but also what we know nowadays about neurodegenerative diseases. And I hope you, uh, you can see my screen right now. Great. So here I am. All right. So as uh, well, Claire introduced super well, 
I started my career in Brazil. I uh, was born and raised there and I went to medical school and residence in pathology. And then when I uh, started to work more on my scientific career, I had training in Brazil, but also in the US and also uh, in Germany. And finally, I went to UCSF in 2009. And what is a neuropathologist? At least I didn't know until I went to medical school. A neuropathologist is someone who is trying to find out how brain diseases develop uh, and how they develop, how they progress, and maybe to find clues so we can find uh, treatments to cure them. For this, we pretty much use a microscope and uh, nowadays some other techniques. And certainly it's very important for us to uh, uh, have uh, brains that we can look at. And how do we get these brains? From people who uh, donate their brains to research. And believe it or not, there is a very good number of people who understand that the only way really to understand the brain and to prevent that other people will have the same thing that sometimes they had is to donate their brain. So I'm, I'm very grateful to all the donors for our research. And I was want to start uh, showing you a case that it's a very common case in our memory clinic. In this case was a male and he came to us at the age of 75. And the problem was that he started to repeat some sentences. So he would say something and then he will say the same something two minutes later. And also uh, he started to misplace objects. So for instance, he didn't know where he put his car key or his glasses. Sometimes uh, he would feel that someone took it. And uh, also uh, he realized that uh, he couldn't remember things that just happened, like what did I have for lunch? Or did I take a shower today? And uh, over the years, it kind of progressed with other kinds of difficulties. Difficult to plan, for instance, to go to the supermarket without a list and remember what you have to buy. Uh, and you know, the initial symptoms started to progress. So it's a progressive disease. It's not that something happens and stay like this. So this gentleman came to our clinic and there was nothing really in the neurological exam. Uh, and there is no family history. And he finally died of pneumonia at the age of 85. So this is a very typical picture of what we call amnestic syndrome or Alzheimer's disease type dementia. People that develop short-term memory loss at the beginning and then it progresses with other brain uh, uh, dysfunctions. And usually when these people, they donate their brain and come to the pathologist, what we find is the hallmarks uh, of Alzheimer's disease, which, is, uh, which are plaques. So we call amyloid plaques. And this is a, a technique that's called immunistochemistry. We use antibodies and then we link these antibodies with some colors. So we can see if there is a protein in which these antibodies should link in the brain. So in this case, uh, beta amyloid peptides, and we see plaques here. And also uh, we see another deposits of protein called phosphotau. So it's a protein tau, it's phosphorylated, and then it deposits inside the neurons. And this is why we see these figures here that we call neurofibrillary tangles, or if you prefer, it's the flame shape. Imagine if you have a candle and it has a flame, so it's the flame shape uh, tau inclusions. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, and it affects a lot of people. A prediction was in 2015 that over 20 million people in the world have it, and these numbers is underestimated. I think it's safe to say that probably one in eight people aged over 55 already have Alzheimer's disease. And because it's a very long disease and is debilitating, every year the people uh, get worse, uh, the estimation is that it costs nowadays already more than heart disease and cancer together. And Alzheimer's disease does not preserve anyone. The person can be famous, can be rich, can be at from any race, from any color, Alzheimer's disease is there. Unfortunately, we don't really have good treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And this is one of the causes that if you take the six more common causes of death uh, in the United States, Alzheimer's disease is this last one, is the only one that we see increases every year. It's not only because the population is aging, but also because we, we have really no treatment as opposed to all the other main causes of death. 
And we don't have treatment and it's not for lack of trying. Uh, this uh, very funny figure here that looks like a target shows all kinds of drugs that are under test, we call these clinical trials, against Alzheimer's disease in 2021. So we see there is a phase one. So these are the first phases of tests. It's safe or not. And then phase two, when we test in very few people. And then phase three, when we test in very large number of people. So maybe some of them will turn out to be good. And uh, probably you heard that at least one of them was recently approved, although uh, it seems that's not really efficient to everybody, just to a certain group of people. So it's unclear if it will really make a difference. But uh, one thing that I can tell is that for many, many years, there were many drugs that were here and not anymore because they just fail. So we still have a lot to learn about Alzheimer's disease and what we need to do to stop and treat the disease. Now, when we hear about Alzheimer's disease, some people associate it with dementia, which is uh, the, lo the loss of our brain capacities to a point that we cannot be independent anymore. And indeed, as the disease progresses, we have a stage in Alzheimer's disease that we call preclinical, and then we have very few memory problems. And finally, it starts to progress and affect other areas of the brain until the person is bedridden. And most of them, or many of them, for instance, die of pneumonia just because they are not moving in the bed. So how come, how do we put together the dementia with what is preclinical? And this is a very uh, good question. And uh, I would like to talk about it, uh, about these definitions a little bit in the next slides. I think it will help everybody to get more, uh, uh, to get more clarity of uh, how we think about these diseases nowadays. And for all of you, you know, that are thinking on research, that are thinking on neuroscience and neurology, maybe to bring your own idea of how we can solve this problem. But one very important thing to keep in mind is that the disease itself, I mean, something that pathologists, for instance, can detect when we look at brain tissue under the microscope, can be detected in people sometimes decades before we see what we call the memory problems. And why is this important? This is important because if we are able to detect the disease even before it causes the memory problems or the symptoms that we associate with Alzheimer's disease, maybe you can block the system already here and then the disease will never progress. And I will say that this is probably the focus of most of the research nowadays. How will we find tools to detect the disease when we cannot tell the person is sick and we call this biomarkers and how we can stop the disease right here. So how do we do that? We do that first trying to understand how, what is our understanding about the disease and how it progressed in the brain. Alzheimer's disease is what we call neurodegenerative disease. So it's a disease that caused the generation of the brain each day a little bit more. All of these diseases, because they degenerate whatever they are, they cause cell death, in which, in the case of the brain, is neurons. So neurons every day die a little bit more in Alzheimer's disease. It's not everything at the same time. It takes years, and it's not everywhere in the brain. Usually there are some areas that are more uh, likely to have neuronal loss than others, but certainly, uh, this is uh, one of the big problems, and it comes to a certain point that the neuronal loss start to become so important that people start to have symptoms. And I brought you an example, because you don't have to believe me. I think uh, to see something is the best way to learn. And this is a preparation of a human brain. It's a human brain that we cut in a coronal section, so from anterior to posterior, and then we stain be painted with a kind of dye, it's called nisil, that will uh, 
stain in blue everything that has something acidic, like DNA, the nucleus, or RNA in the cytoplasm. And what we can see here is a cortex, and the cortex has layers. This is a cortex that's called entorhinal cortex. And I want to call your attention that the entorhinal cortex is very special because it has this group of cells here in the surface that look like island, and they are called layer two cells. So this is a person who doesn't have Alzheimer's disease, and we can see these clusters of cells very clearly. But in someone who has Alzheimer's disease, it completely disappears. So this is part of the neuronal laws that I'm talking about. And actually, this is one of the first areas of the brain that have brain that has neuronal loss. But this is not all in Alzheimer's disease and in other neurodegenerative diseases. Another very important feature is this accumulation of abnormal proteins. And I show about it a little bit before. So in Alzheimer's disease, we have in particular accumulation of two main abnormal proteins. One is this beta amyloid that will deposit like plaques. These plaques are outside the cells. And then maybe if you remember how a bread full of mold looks like, it looks like mold indeed. Alzheimer's, the person who described the disease, when he first saw it under the microscope, he was sure that his preparation had mold. He didn't realize at that time that this was part of the disease. And then the second hallmark, the different protein is called tau protein. And tau protein is a protein that's present in all the neurons. It's very important to make the neurons work. But when it starts to get uh, dysfunctional, it accumulates. And it accumulates again in form of these inclusions inside the neurons. So usually we find accumulation of proteins in the area that we find neuronal death. They are correlated. So again, I brought this picture of the entorhinal cortex with these islands of cells. And if you look at the picture underneath in which we stain for inclusions, we will see that most of the inclusions are exactly on these islands of cells. Now, a third thing that it's very important for us to consider, especially if we want to be successful in doing research in Alzheimer's disease, is this concept of stereotypical spread. There are some diseases, for instance, uh, infection or inflammation, that once you have it, you might have a bacteria, a virus, will pretty much affect everything where it, they can get reach of, and then it spreads. Or if someone has a stroke, lack of oxygen leading to cell death, the cell death will happen when there is the lack of oxygen. So it depends on the vessel that gets affected. But in neurodegenerative disease, what is more incredible in my point of view is that they always start in the same part of the brain. In every case, each disease in a different part, but then in the same place. And then when it spreads, it always spreads following the same direction, which is not necessarily to the neighbor cells, could be to a different area of the brain that it's interconnected, but it's always predictable. So how does it work? Remember, in Alzheimer's disease, I've shown you that we have accumulation of plaques and we have accumulation of tangles. And I will start with plaques. So the first parts of the brain that we can detect plaques are in the neocortex. And this is what we call phase one here in red. After we have these plaques in the neocortex, we start to have plaques in the isocortex and in the limbic area. Finally, it goes to the basal ganglia. So then at this point, start to become subcortical. So subcortical is late. Then it reaches the brainstem and then it finally reaches the cerebellum. So cortical and then subcortical and then cerebellum. The tangles, it's a different story, despite being the same disease. We first find tangles in subcortical areas. Remember something that comes late for amyloid especially in the brainstem and the hypothalamus. And then instead of going to the neocortex, which is the first area to show amyloid, it goes to the isocortex and finally starts to spread to the neocortex. So it's almost an opposite direction where tangles uh, start to form and where plaques start to form. 
And why is this and how they, they interconnect to each other? It's still one of the open questions in Alzheimer's disease. And who knows, one of you will be able to answer this. This is a reconstruction from two brains, one at the moderate stage of Alzheimer's disease and the other one at severe brain. And I just wanted to show you the amount of inclusions that we get in these brains as, as the disease progresses. It's a lot. And for sure, at this point, it already causes a lot of symptoms. Now, this idea of stereotypical spread is the basis for all the staging we have for the disease. In the case of Alzheimer's disease, we use a scheme now that's called ABC, which is pretty much a combination of where we find plots and where we find tangles. Usually, they kind of get worse together. Some, so it's very rare a case that we have a disconnect. So one thing I think I want to make it very clear is that although we still use in many settings the word Alzheimer's disease to describe a, a illness with dementia, since 2017, the international community kind of accepted that the definition for Alzheimer's disease is biological. So if it reaches a certain ABC, we call this Alzheimer's disease, independent of what happens in the clinical sphere. So probably in a few years, we start uh, seeing the name Alzheimer's disease not being used to the clinical anymore, maybe to change to amnestic disease or dementia of Alzheimer's type is to be seen. Now, this is kind of uh, the title of the talk. Is memory loss the first symptom that we see in Alzheimer's disease? Maybe you remember that I show you that uh, the, the tangles, and the tangles is really the best correlate of what happens in the clinics. They don't start accumulating first in the hippocampal formation, which is the memory area but they actually start accumulating in several other subcortical areas in the brain that probably it's not really directly related to memory. In fact, all these areas or nuclei, because they are subcortical, they are very important because they are part of something that's called the neuromodulatory subcortical system, which is a small number of neurons actually less than 1% of all the neurons we have in the brain, but they are responsible to produce the major neuromodulators like acetylcholine and dopamine and histamine, et cetera. And these are the first who start accumulating tau. So is it possible that we only have symptoms of all this disease when we start to get tangles in the hippocampus years later, and then of course it will manifest with memory? And this is something that my lab was very curious to learn about. So how did we ask this question? We asked this question by comparing uh, scales that measure what we call neuropsychological symptoms, which is not memory, but it's things like agitation, anxiety, appetite dysfunction, depression, sleep problems. These are symptoms, they are modulated by these subcortical areas. So we look at donors who donated their brains, but when we examine them, either they didn't have any problem in the brain or they have very little just in the subcortical areas with almost no involvement of the cortex whatsoever yet. And even in those people with very limited uh, pathological changes, we could find that they had a higher risk to, to have some of these neuropsychological symptoms. So we said, aha, maybe there is something there. Maybe we don't have to wait the disease to reach the hippocampus and give memory loss for us to have symptoms because of Alzheimer's disease. And we got particularly interested on the sleep changes. And why that? Because if you look at the literature, if you look at epidemiological studies, those you know that follow people for many years, you will see that there is a high prevalence of sleep problems in people that come to develop dementia 
due to Alzheimer's disease later on. And again, these sleep disturbances, usually they start to show before memory problems start to show. And we know from animal models that even from imaging models in humans, that if we don't sleep well, we start to accumulating even more of these pathological proteins that we see in Alzheimer's disease. So we thought, well, what if uh, this, uh, you know, sleep problems is already Alzheimer's disease? I mean, it, it could be possible, right? Because uh, the, the nuclei that control sleep, they are involved very early. So we went to the literature to try to, le to learn everything that has been described for Alzheimer's disease and sleep. And what we found were a lot of papers, excellent papers, explaining that there is this theory in which when we don't sleep well, we cannot clean the beta amyloid in the evening because this is cleaned by the glymphatic system. So it accumulates and then in turn disrupt the sleep-wake system much more. And if you look at these schemes, you see that tau, it's very small here at the corner and was not really part of the equation. But we said, wait a minute, how is it possible that tau changes are not part of the equation? And to show you this, I brought you this scheme from a recent paper that we wrote. And these are these neuromodulatory subcortical nuclei. And we color code them to show those that promote awakening, those that promote sleep. And then we also uh, use some uh, patterns here to show the ones that start accumulated tau even before the cortex in the very early stages. And if you pay a lot of attention and you don't have to do it now, I mean, this paper is published, uh, you will see that the nuclei that promote awakening that keep us awake are the ones that really accumulate this tau very early in the disease. So then we got even more intrigued and decided to look for tools to be able to uh, study this. And I brought this picture here to show that, you know, you can have a very good idea in science and you can have a great hypothesis, but you need to have a good tool to study that. If you don't have a good tool, probably you won't get to the answer. So what is the tool that we wanted to explore? So first of all, we felt that we had to study this in humans because humans and animal models have a very different brain and sleep is very tightly regulated. And again, different in these species. The problem of studying the human brain is that we cannot do any kind of manipulation. We get what we get is what we call cross-sectional. So in order to try to overcome this problem, we created a collection that had brains at different stages of the disease. So we could model in a way the disease progression, even if we could not manipulate uh, the brain. It's not perfect, but certainly just better to contrast, uh, you know, a yes or no. And third thing that we made very uh, clear that we established in the lab is that when we were looking at any one of these nuclei, it's not good enough just to take a piece of this brain and put in the microscope and count. And the reason for this is because the cells are distributed in the brain in a very heterogeneous way. So if you just make a cut somewhere, you might have a false result just because the cell is distributed in a certain way. And this kind of assessment in which we look at the whole thing, it's called stereology. So because we like computers, and we wanted to make sure we were in the right place. We also reconstructed all our regions of interest in, in 3D using computers. And you can see they are very complex and they are very beautiful here, but we knew exactly where we were. And I brought this video here from the lab just to show how we create these brain blocks. So we get a brain, we don't want to, it to get distorted. So we print in 3D in plastic, these skulls. We let the brain fix in this skull. You see, it always gets smaller, but at least it doesn't get deformed. Then we put in these big blocks, and then we cut in these big machines here that we call microtones. Anyway, so back to Drizzly. So we were very intrigued why tau 
were not in the equation on all these studies uh, looking at sleep dysfunction in Alzheimer's disease. So for every disease or every, every uh, study we do, we have to have a hypothesis, even if it's wrong. So we call this working hypothesis. And our working hypothesis is that this tau related lesions in the way controlling network will cause severe neuronal loss in this nuclei and they will probably contribute to the sleep problems in Alzheimer's disease. So it will be like a tau derived uh, sleep problem. So how would it work? So imagine in a normal person, it's awake during the day and sleep during the night. And how does it work? It works because when we are awake, the awake neurons are very active. And then when it's time to sleep, there is a mechanism that shifts it very quickly and make the sleep neurons who are different from the awake neurons very active and shut down the awake neurons. So we thought, well, probably in Alzheimer's disease, these awake neurons, they will degenerate because of this tau. And then this will explain why people with Alzheimer's disease, they tend to nap during the day. They cannot keep away in the same way that normal people do because these awake neurons are never there. And then during the night, they don't sleep very well also because they have other problems and we call this fragmented sleep. So when we do research, we always try to have a positive control and a negative control. And in this particular case, our negative control will be normal people. But then we thought, how about if we include a group of people who have also disease that might affect these nuclei, but they don't cause the generation of this nuclei. And let's see what happens. So we decided to look in a group of disease that called tauopathies. They are also neurodegenerative disease. They are different than Alzheimer's disease, despite the fact they have tau inclusions. These are different kinds of taus, and they certainly don't have amyloid. And the disease we decided to look at called progressive supranuclear pulse. And why this? Because we know from our clinics that patients with progressive supranuclear pulse, that I will call here PSP, they never sleep. They usually sleep four hours in a period of 24 hours, sometimes even less than this. And not only that, but when you give them the opportunity to take naps during the day and even control people when you put them you know, in a dark room during the day, very comfy, they kind of fall asleep in about 10 minutes. People with PSP, they never fall asleep. Even if they didn't sleep during the night and the previous night and the night before. So we thought, okay, let's improve our working hypothesis. So we have again, the idea that in Alzheimer's disease, the awake nuclei will die. But in PSP, we felt that probably what was going on is that the sleep nuclei degenerate, but the awake nuclei are preserved. So it continued to be as good as before. And we tested, and actually it was tested by Joseph O and Rana Ezer, and they did it when they were undergraduates. So, uh, you know, you don't really need to be a full professor to do uh, excellent research. And they look at all these uh, awake promoting nuclei, the most important ones in the brain. And the first thing they did was to determine if uh, there was tau deposits there. And they found tau deposits, you see the normal is uh, transparent, red is tau deposits, there are tau deposits in all of them. But they also determined that the neurons only die in Alzheimer's disease and die by about 80%. So it kind of made sense uh, to think that our hypothesis of this early degeneration was correct, but we cannot stop that. In our clinics, People donate their brain, but they come every year to participate in our research. And we have a growing number of donors that when they come, they agree in doing objective sleep testing. So they do something called polysonography, which is an electroencephalogram uh, with video that we do overnight. And we measure when they wake up, when they sleep, how many hours, what is the cycle, and then we counted, again, the neurons of these individuals, and we could show that not only 
the people with Alzheimer's disease have this very severe degeneration of the awake nuclei, but it totally correlates with this worse awaking system. And we did even more. We do a kind of we did a kind of uh, similar approach also with EEG, measuring this alpha synchrony. These are waves that uh, we have when we are awake. And then contrasting this with delta theta synchrony, which are the waves that we have when we are sleepy. And we could show that there is a direct correlation between the amount of tau and worsening of this alpha synchrony. Again, giving even more uh, food, so to say, to this theory that uh, sleep problems in Alzheimer's disease, at least at the very early stages, they are directly related to this tau accumulation and the generation of the weight promoting nuclei. So is this important? Is it has a, a clinical, uh, uh, clinical importance? You know, every time we do basic research, it might take some years until we learn uh, what is the important uh, for this clinically. But in this particular case, the results were so clear that uh, it allow us to start a clinical trial, not for ED, for PSP, trying an approach in which instead of using the regular sleep treatment uh, that we use for everybody that doesn't work for these patients, we will use a drug that is approved to use that will shut down the wake system. So maybe they will sleep and we will have the results very, very soon. So the takeaway of this is that I hope I could show you that when we are studying a disease, even when it is very well classic and well determined like Alzheimer's disease, uh, usually it's more complex than when we believe. And it's important to look carefully, at, 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 especially at the early stages, because in this particular case, not only you could demonstrate that this uh, neuromodulatory system is affected earlier, but it has clinical symptoms and it also suggests that probably uh, the same drug that we use to treat tau problems in Alzheimer's disease will serve to treat these symptoms and hopefully delay the disease spread. Now, you saw this slide before. This is the gentleman that I showed you about that had memory problems and got Alzheimer's disease. And maybe you remember that I told you that we try not to use the term Alzheimer's disease to determine the clinical symptoms. And why is that? It's because there is a lot of people who have exactly the same symptoms, but they don't have Alzheimer's disease or they have Alzheimer's disease and other stuff. Yes, Sorry? But most important than this, we have been discovering the past years because we have these donors that come to research every year and then they donate their brain, that there are people that have a neurodegenerative condition, they are progressive, and, but they are not these memory problems. For instance, this first case the, here, it's a woman, and she had a problem that it's pretty much related to a visual problem. She couldn't see very well. First, she will hit the car, and then she, she couldn't see on her uh, right side. Of course, she went to the eye doctor and there was nothing wrong. Actually, there was a problem in the visual area of the brain with something that we call posterior cortical atrophy. And a little bit different with like different of her, but also no memory problems. I, I brought this other case, also a woman. She was 61 when she came and she really didn't have short-term memory problems, but she couldn't remember words and it make it very difficult for her to communicate. And of course it progressed. And then she also uh, died of the disease. And she had something that we call primary progressive aphasia. So very different from the short-term memory problems. But when they came to autopsy and we look at their brain, they had the exact similar Alzheimer disease than the gentleman with memory problems had. So we say, how this is possible? And we were very curious also, as the field is very curious also. So there were several theories to explain to this. One of them was say, well, maybe these people just have other disease in the brain. And when it's combined with Alzheimer's disease, the clinical manifestation is different. Or maybe they have differences in how the amyloid plaques or the tau deposit in the brain. 
or maybe could be even something intrinsic, maybe a combination of genes that the person has. And when the disease hits, uh, it affects neurons in a different way. And one of the uh, terms that we use for this is distinct selective vulnerability. So, well, when we have a question, again, we have an hypothesis and we test. We have to have a testable hypothesis. So the first thing we did was to test if the problem was having co-pathology. So we took a group of people with Alzheimer's disease in the autopsy, and many of them had this atypical presentation, actually 67, which is a good number for post-mortem study, compared to almost 100 that had this amnestic syndrome. And then we look at all kinds of different diseases that could be in the brain. And we did find a difference. We find a difference in the amount of problems in the vasculature, in the vessels in the brain. But actually, the group who had more this problem was the typical group, not the atypical group. So at the end of the day, we could determine that having different pathologies will not explain this atypical presentation in Alzheimer's disease. So we went to look of this idea of maybe the tau and the amyloid deposit in different places. We didn't find any difference with amyloid, but it did with tau. We found that people that have this atypical syndrome they tend to have more tau, and again, this correlates with neuronal loss in the regional areas of the brain that correspond to these symptoms. It's a no-brainer. I mean, it's if you try to stage the disease, the staging will be the same, but if you try to quantify the amount of pathology, then it will be very, very different. And actually, some studies that use PET for tau, for tau tracer with a PET scan, show the same thing. No issues with amyloid, no difference, but certain regional differences with tau. So what causes this? And then we felt that the answer could be this selective neuronal vulnerability. So how do we study there? And it was almost impossible to study this in humans until a few years ago, but the technology is improving very quickly. And nowadays, we have something that's called single nucleus technology. So we decided to test if we could use the single nucleus technology. And in this case, we use for transcriptomics. So it's called single nucleus RNA sequencing to find changes in selective vulnerability in the brain. So for this, we tested first with people at different stages of the disease. So we got three controls, uh, three four people with kind of early stage and three people with very late stages. And then we dissect areas of the brain that are important for Alzheimer's disease. So again, the entorhinal cortex that I mentioned before, but also an area that gets affected very late, very late in Alzheimer's disease, at least for tau. And then we did this single nucleus rna seq So how does it work? First, we take this piece of brain and we dissociate the cells. And then we put in a machine that put each cell in a drop of oil with a barcode. So when we do the transcriptomics, because of the barcode, we can use bioinformatic tools to separate uh, what comes from what. So when we can do it, the first result that we get is that we can separate what are the types of cells and how many of each type of cells we have for all these brains. And this is shown in these graphs here that looks like uh, colorful clouds. And then we ask, okay, is there any particular group of cell that as the disease progresses, it starts to be less important, meaning they disappear, they die. And, you know, at the first pass, we really didn't find too much very significant. But we found that at least for a group of cells called uh, uh, excitatory neurons, that we kind of knew they are more uh, prone to have, uh, uh, to die in Alzheimer's disease. It was not statistically significant, but uh, we found that the numbers drop. So then we made another analysis, just looking at different types of excitatory nuclei. And we create some algorithms to try to divide them, to divide this group. And then we find a group of excitatory neurons that were characterized by this gene called RORB. In the, we didn't know about it. Again, we use unbiased bioinformatics to get there. That seems to lose a lot of numbers in Alzheimer's disease. So we said, great. So how do we confirm that? 
Then we have to go back to tissue. We took tissue of a lot of people, again, enterhinocortex, from all stages of the disease, and we stain it using antibodies, and we count the number of cells. And I hope you can see here that indeed this population of raw veneers that's here in green kind of disappear uh, as the disease progresses. Of course, we quantified everything and we could show that this raw B have a more tendency than other uh, neurons to accumulate these tau inclusions and then to die. So this was very exciting that we could do this with humans. And we will start now in collaboration because nowadays disease, uh, disease no. <laughs> uh, research really works better in collaborations when we bring expertise that one person can never get by itself. And we'll do a very uh, sophisticated uh, research combining the single nucleus technology, both with transcriptomics, but with in situ proteomics and more traditional pathology to try to understand what makes typical and atypical cases in Alzheimer's disease uh, be different. And I think I want to finish here, but uh, one last message I would like to share with you is that dementia is a worldwide problem and I think we all know about it. But it's important to notice that two thirds of people living with dementia, they live in a lower middle income country. And usually these countries, they have less resources for research. Not only that, epidemiological studies, they show that certain minorities, uh, well, minorities here, but not in other places, but no Caucasians, they have higher prevalences of dementia than Caucasians. But almost universally, all these studies include Caucasians because they are done usually in countries that have more resources. So it's not only important to try to understand what the disease causes and try to find uh, treatment for this, but to promote inclusion and equal opportunity to people from all kinds of backgrounds to participate in research, because we know that what we find in one group might be different in another group, and the treatment might be different also. So we cannot just generalize. So I think it's becoming very, very important in uh, all our studies. And I would like to finish here. Of course, I don't do anything by myself. There is a very dynamic group of people, a lot of students that work with me. And it's really a pleasure, even more now that we can go back to the lab, both in the US and in Brazil, and of course, all the funding agencies. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I hope you have a lot of questions. Even if I won't be able to answer here, I can send you questions later. There is no stupid question. So let's have a discussion now. And thank you very much. All righty, sorry, it took me a minute to uh, to get off uh, <laughs> to get off a of Zoom. But I'd like to first start by let everyone. Let's please give Dr. Grinberg. You can either applaud or use your little. Yes, I see everyone using the little reactions. Um, now we'd like to take questions from. Um, our champion. So we really like if you're you're a national champion, please uh, feel free to ask a question. Um, that's why she she's here to, to interact with you. And again, if you feel comfortable, um, it'd be great if you could turn on your your camera so we can see your faces. Um, and uh, also, if you if you want to send your question to me um, instead of asking it yourself, feel free to do so in chat. Oh, yes, I see. Uh, we have a hand up. So Jonah has a question. Um, well, uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question was, um, because I found many things obviously a little hard to understand when it came to staining methods and all this specialized stuff. Um, but then you said that there are those symposiums, I think, um, of different scientists uh, scientists and uh, maybe labs, if I understood that correctly, um, where you combine all these different techniques. How much uh, work does it need to, uh, or do you need to give uh, each other, first of all, some little lectures to introduce them to your technique, or is it uh, basic techniques that everyone normally knows about? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, I would say from my, uh, 
own experience. I mean, when I did my PhD, I, I learned some techniques both in the courses I took, but also in the labs I rotated. And of course, we try to rotate in the labs that have techniques that we are interested. But things evolve very quickly uh, and fast. So nowadays, uh, there are more and more you know, webinars and things that you can learn uh, different techniques, but uh, proved to be almost impossible to know everything, especially because they get every sp more specialized and they require equipment that are very expensive. So this is another reason why collaboration is very important. Of course, we publish our protocols, but uh, it's, it's like to cook, right? You have to practice a lot until you get there. So sometimes it makes more sense just to combine, uh, combine, uh, you know, strings and try to tackle a problem together, at least, again, uh, in my experience. But uh, still, each lab does more than one thing. We always have to update ourselves. Does this make sense? Oh, yes, it does. Excellent. So uh, I see that uh, we have one individual, Jaden has his hand up, but I did receive a question through messaging. Um, and so one of our, um, one of our champions from, from Egypt wants to know, is there anything a patient can do to stop the progression of Alzheimer's disease um, if he has shown early symptoms? Yeah, that's a, that's a very uh, important question. And actually there are many clinicians that they don't like to tell patients that they have Alzheimer's disease at early stages because of this lack of treatments. Let's see if it will change with these new drugs. Although, I, as I told you, it, it, at this point is very controversial. Although, but there is things that we can do. So there are, again, these epidemiological studies that follow populations for years, especially from, uh, 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 from Scandinavian countries. It have been showing that about one third of the reasons for dementia are preventable. Preventable how? We know that low education is a higher risk for dementia. It's not a higher risk for Alzheimer's disease, but when we accumulate all this stress in our brain, if our brain is better prepared to deal with it, we can tolerate it more, like we can tolerate more if we do exercise for something for our body. So education is very key. Diet is key. Uh, especially at middle age, people that at middle age has good control of everything that affects the heart, blood pressure, uh, uh, diabetes, obesity, we know that have less chance to have dementia. And physical exercise is always important, not only because it preserves the heart, it's important, but also uh, it releases certain hormones that directly go to the brain and make the brain work better. So again, we don't know exactly we can, what can stop the Alzheimer's disease to deposit in the brain and spread, but we know how to make our brain stronger to deal with it. And it does make a difference, especially in the elderly population if you delay diseases by five or 10 years. Excellent, thank you. Um, so Jaden, do you want to ask your question? Yes, I'm sorry I cannot turn on my camera because my video not working. Well, my camera is not working, so no yeah, sorry. Yeah, so um, is it Dr. Lee T. Greenberg? I mean, are you asking how to pronounce my name? Yeah, yes, I'm not too sure. My, my name is Leah, and T Leia. is my, well, it's just the first letter of my middle name. So you can call okay, me Leah. Okay. Okay, Le. So, um, like, what did it take from you, or like, what was required for you to make it this far in life? Like, can you give me like a brief description of your journey? Sure, with pleasure. Well, I wanted to do research in uh, brain degeneration since I was a child, and I thought it was like to be an astronaut. You know, absolutely out of reach. Uh, I also like, you know, people and disease in general. So I went to medical school and in medical school, in a way, I tried different specialties to see which one will combine better with my idea to do research in brain. I went to neurology and I felt at least where I was, they was just kind of, you know, trying to treat, not trying to discover, uh, depends in each university. 
And I went to different places. And then finally, I landed in pathology again, which I didn't know. And uh, I thought it was a cool place because people were trying to decide how disease work. So I did all my training. And then I went to a PhD. I mean, one thing took to the other. And, you know, I started very small. I started uh, trying to answer simple questions. And very important, at least it was very important for me, reaching out to more senior people that I felt could help me to learn. And it didn't have to be in my institution. I mean, nowadays we have internet. At that time we have already. Nowadays it's even easier. I was writing to people and saying, look, I'm a young researcher here in Brazil. We don't have many resources, but I'm very interested in learning. Is there anything you can do? Some people answer, some people don't. But uh, in this process, I, I, I got very good mentors, very good people who, you know, took their time to help to guide me. And then, I, you know, in the process of a very hard work, slowly, slowly, I started to uh, be able to ask my questions and get resources to try to answer them. Uh, I think it's important also to get some, not focus necessarily, but to try to, to get the hypothesis that you can test. You know, I could say, I want to know how many stars are in the universe. Many people want to know that. But I mean, how do we test them? And so this is something that requires study, you know, reading the literature, trying to get ideas, and uh, then trying to implement that. Excellent, thank you. Um, and so we have another question. From thank you one very of our much. Oh. Pleasure. Oh, sorry, thank you go ahead, Jane. You can thank her. Uh, so our next question uh, that I see uh, comes from our uh, one of our, our Canadian champions, and Tony. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Greenberg. I really enjoyed that presentation. I just had a question. So. You referred to lots of the biomarkers in the brain that can be found during Alzheimer's and some dementia. Uh, have you come across any say, uh, uh, symptoms or signs or biomarkers in other uh, organs of the body? So maybe like the heart or some of the other systems? They are correlated with Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's a great question. That's a great question because uh, we know, for instance, that in Parkinson's disease, which is also you know, a disease in the brain that people shake, actually we find the first signs of the disease in the digestory system and in the heart system, the, the, the nervous system of this organ. So it's more peripheral before it becomes central. There is nothing really in Alzheimer's disease that seems to be the same. But there are some studies suggesting that certain kinds of inflammation, they are systemic inflammations, they also increase the risk for Alzheimer's disease. We are on the early days of all this, saying what? That when we try to look at these markers, just by looking at these markers, we cannot distinguish people who have Alzheimer's disease for people that don't have Alzheimer's disease. So at this point, it's not clear if it affects other organs. But... There is developing biomarkers to try to find the trash that the brain is producing in plasma, which is much easier to try to get liquor or any other, um, any other uh, thing inside the brain. Again, it's relatively early days, but very promising. And I believe that in two or three years, we might have a clinical test that we take blood and we can measure if people have Alzheimer's disease or not. We might not be able to monitor increase over time, but we might be able to get a, a, a threshold uh, for yes or no, which is already very helpful, at least for continuing further studies. Thank you. All righty, we have our, our champion from South Korea, Yuna. Thank you. A uh, uh, question about your last results about um, having excited neuron featuring some kinds of special um, genes that are, mm -hmm. that are uh, associated with Alzheimer's diseases. So I was wondering if this could be um, commercially developed into um, things like RT-PCR kits, like we use PCR kits in uh, coronavirus detection. So. Mm -hmm. uh, could, could it be um, commercial development to some kind of kit for detection of earlier 
autoimmune diseases or any other kinds of applications? Yeah, thank you for the question. So, you know, these results with uh, single nucleus transcriptomes were very uh, exciting for us, especially because uh, these genes have not been uh, involved at least in or identifying Alzheimer's disease before. One thing I want to make a distinction, we were not looking at genes that go up or down, which could be, you know, a way to treat, but markers of neurons that uh, are more vulnerable. So if you ask me what will be uh, the next development on research on this, so what's happening now, there are several groups using CRISPR to manipulate this gene in uh, neuronal cultures. In animals, I'm not aware yet, but probably to come and see what happens. So does it really change anything? So if it shows that it changes, for instance, if you manipulate these genes, the, the, the neurons will survive. Uh, the idea would be to try to develop therapeutics to shield this uh, uh, vulnerable neurons. So uh, hopefully they will be less vulnerable. How we'll get there, probably still the next step. I'm not very sure, but just by knowing which are these neurons, at least we can understand what they have different from the neurons that are not vulnerable and try to protect them. So that's the idea at this point, my change. Thank you, Thank you so much for your answer. Sure. We have other questions from our, our national champions. I, I did get another question in through the chat. You kind of already answered it, but someone was wondering, you know, is how did you know this is what you wanted to do for the rest of your life? And and well, and maybe you don't want to really do it for the absolute rest of your <laughs> of your life. But, right. You know. I think in my case, I was absolutely lucky because I, I kind of knew, but what I didn't know is how I will do that. Because again, I, I came from Brazil. It's not that, you know, research there is as strong or it's not even a career uh, as it is in other places. Uh, I didn't speak English very well. Uh, so it was also a barrier in a way. And uh, because of this, I almost, you know, kind of gave up research. I went to medical school that was the closest I could find and I was very happy there. And then, you know, I think from all of us, there is a kind of series of uh, lucky coincidences or being uh, paying attention of what's going on and jumping into opportunities and then uh, being able to do it. But again, especially in my case, because I came from a place that research is not uh, strong, I was trained also in a profession that I could make a living if research would not materialize. I think that's at, at least for me, this was important. And I think it's important for all my students from there, because again, if something happens with research uh, uh, funding, you know, many people might be without a job and without being able to support themselves. And this is very serious. Important. Excellent, thank you. Uh, anyone, any other questions from our national champions that are, that are present with us? Well, if, if there aren't any, then I will, we will close up our session. And again, I'd like everyone to thank Dr. Leah Grinberg for being with us today. And I want to thank uh, Claire Sexton, part of our, um, our planning committee for being with us and introducing her. Um, it was really wonderful. I think everyone really in, enjoyed and learned a lot from you today. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you and congratulations for uh, being the winners of this very, uh, you know, high level championship. It's very exciting. I, I, I hope to see you in the future in our conferences too. All righty, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.